Okay. So it looks like we're getting close to quorum. I, I will go ahead and get us started, although I know some people are still trickling in. Um, so welcome to Global Health Council's introductory or 101 webinar on the World Health Assembly. Um, my name is Eliana Monteforte. I'm the director for special projects at Global Health Council. And with me today is my colleague, Ansley Moore, who is the Senior Manager for Advocacy and Engagement. And we will both be doing our presentation for today. Uh, if you could go to the next slide, please. Thank you. So I'm gonna first go through our agenda so you know what we'll be presenting today. Um, I'll be doing a bit of logistics this morning. Um, we'll talk a little bit about Global Health Council, a little bit about the team that will be at World Health Assembly. We will also talk about what the World Health Assembly is, um, and then some fast facts about the specific World Health Assembly, which is the 77th. Um, and then um, my colleague Ansley will talk about how you all can engage in World Health Assembly, both in person and virtually. We know some people will be on the ground in Geneva and others will just be tracking things online. So we will provide information about how you can do both. Um, then we're gonna go through the key issue areas that Global Health Council is specifically following this year noting that there are many, many things on the agenda at the World Health Assembly. Um, so very hard, almost impossible to track everything. GHC has some priorities and we will go over those. We'll also be talking about events at World Health Assembly and some communications that we're going to be sharing with you. Um, and then we'll just do a quick summary of everything and we'll then move on to the question and answer section of the webinar where you will have opportunities to raise your hand and ask questions or put those in the chat. Next slide. <clears throat> okay, so before we get to information about Global Health Council, I know some of you are very familiar with us, some of you maybe not so much. Um, I just wanted to go through some logistics quickly. So First, this webinar is being recorded and the recording and the PowerPoint presentation that you're seeing today is going to be shared after the event. I know that's usually the number one question we get for these webinars. Um, throughout the webinar, you're welcome to submit questions in the chat. Um, and when we get to the Q&A portion, we'll do our best to answer all your questions. As I said, you'll also have an opportunity to raise your hand. This is during the question and answer portion of our webinar. Uh, when we call on your name, you're welcome to go off mute and um, go ahead and ask your question. Um, we will be having some poll questions during the question and answer section of this webinar. So we do hope that everyone here can at least participate um, in the poll questions. Um, and then other than that, I think we can get started with the program. So a little bit about uh, Global Health Council. So we work really closely with our members, our advocates, implementers, policymakers, and other partners on global health priorities worldwide. We truly at Global Health Council believe in the power of the collective voice to improve global health and well-being with informed investments and policies. So how do we do that? Um, we bring together our advocates to align our advocacy and consolidate requests to policymakers. We share knowledge and information and specifically resources to support advocates. And we also amplify advocacy messages, many of which we collectively develop um, with our membership and our partners. Um, some of our key global health advocacy priorities, or we call them pillars, um, include global health security. We work on health equity, multilateral engagement, and US leadership in global health. And as you can see, those are very cross-cutting. So in addressing these priorities, we also work on various different disease and topic areas. Um, our members include non-governmental implementing organizations, philanthropic organizations, corporations and corporate foundations, associations and coalitions. We have academia and think tanks. 
Um, and then we also have consulting uh, organizations. So you can see that we have a lot of uh, diversity of thought within our membership. Um, next slide, please. So a little bit about who will be on the ground in Geneva for the World Health Assembly. Um, we have Alice Aluash, who is our director for membership um, and development, and she is going to be um, preparing a networking session that, for those of you who will be in Geneva, will be invited to, invited to. Our president and CEO, Elisha Giorgio will be there. I will be there as well as my colleague, um, Ansley Moore. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so taking a step back, what is World Health Assembly? And I know some of us are very familiar with it, other of us might not be. Um, so we wanted to provide some basic information about WHA. So it's basically a decision-making body of the World Health Organization. And what they do during World Health Assembly is they determine policies for the organization, um, they appoint the director general, they supervise financial policies, they review and approve the proposed program um, and budget for um, WHO. Um, and the agenda for World Health Assembly is actually determined by the executive board before, um, and that usually happens around January. Um, so World Health Assembly happens every year, um, typically in May. And the official proceedings occur at the Palais des Nations, which is um, in Geneva, Switzerland. And the people who are allowed to join the official proceedings are delegations from WHO um, and member states, as well as non-state actors in official relations with WHO. Um, just a little bit about NSAs briefly, since I have been getting a few questions about that. Um, over email. So your organization has to go through um, a pretty detailed process, application process for becoming a non-state actor in official relations with WHO. So unless you've gone through that process and received what we call NSA status, you aren't allowed to actually go into the Palais to listen to official proceedings. If you are a non-state actor in official relations with WHO, um, then you do have the ability to join those official proceedings. Um, and what happens is within the entire agenda for the World Health Assembly, we are given specific agenda items where we're either allowed to give individual statements as organizations, or we come together and form what are called constituency or group statements on specific agenda items with other organizations that are also non-state actors in official relations with WHO. Um, and those constituency statements are written in collaboration with these uh, grouping organizations and one of, or the lead organization for that constituency statement would then read it in the official proceedings. So that is what it looks like to be a non-state actor in official relations during uh, the World Health Assembly. Um, next slide, please. So some quick facts about the 77th World Health Assembly. Um, these are the dates for this year, May 27th to June 1st. Um, so the official proceedings typically start around 9 a.m. Um, and then go until noon and then there's a break and then we go again until 5.30. Because this year's agenda is so robust, we've already received information um, from WHO that they are expecting to host evening sessions beginning on Tuesday. Um, which basically means that you, we get a quick break from say 5.30 to 6.30 and then the evening sessions begin after that and they can go until 10 o'clock at night. Sometimes they even go until midnight. So it really just depends on how quickly the chair gets through um, the agenda. So keeping that in mind uh, for, for your schedules if you're following official proceedings. Um, as I, I mentioned, organizations that are non-state actors in official relations with WHO are allowed to bring a delegation, um, an in-person delegation that can join the official proceedings. This year, they're only allowing six delegates, um, which means that we only have six badges that 
allow you to go into the Palais where those official proceedings are happening. Um, we have already assigned five of those six badges to uh, Global Health Council members, uh, and there will be one that will be raffled off to another Global Health Council member. Um, if you are a member of Global Health Council, you can join the delegation. If you are not, um, and you're not in official relations with WHO, then you would not be able to join the official proceedings at the Palais. However, if you do want to follow what happens in the Palais, all of the sessions are typically live streamed. And later on in the PowerPoint presentation, we're going to provide links for you um, as to where you can find all the information about World Health Assembly, where you can find the live stream link, the agenda. Right now, I think there's still only a preliminary agenda up that's going to change. Um, and then I did also want to talk about side sessions versus unofficial side sessions. So typically as part of the World Health Assembly, they have official side sessions aside from the official proceedings that are happening on the specific agenda items within the Palais. Because there's construction going on in the Palais, there's no space for those. So there are actually no official side sessions that are happening in the Palais as the proceedings are, are occurring. Um, but as many of you all know, outside of the Palais, there is quite a lot that's happening. Um, many, many organizations create what are called unofficial side sessions across various different topics that are both on the agenda uh, within WHA specifically or that are just related to global health in general. Some of these are open um, to anybody who's in Geneva to join. Some of them are only for people in Geneva. Some might be both um, virtual hybrid, both virtual and for in-person participation. Um, we'll talk about events later on, but just know that at World Health Assembly, it's not only the official proceedings that people often follow and attend, but it's also what's happening outside the Palais in the sidelines of the World Health Assembly and all of those unofficial side sessions that organizations like GHC and many of our members host on various different topics. And those sessions are an opportunity to learn about what's happening in global health, what's important, learn a little bit specifically about some of the topics at World Health Assembly that are being discussed in official proceedings. Um, and it's also an opportunity really to network too. Um, so I always kind of think of WHA as what's happening in the Palais and what's happening out of the Palais. And various people choose to go to WHA even if they don't have access to the Palais just to attend those sessions that are happening. Um, so I think as we go to the next slide, I am going to hand it over to my colleague Ansley, who is going to talk about how you can engage both online and in person with us at WHA. Over to you, Ansley. Thanks so much, Eliana. That was a really comprehensive overview of what WHA is and really great scene setting. And thanks so much for your questions in the chat already. Um, so as Eliana mentioned, you don't have to be in Geneva to engage in WHA. You can engage virtually as well. But maybe we can start with how you might engage with Global Health Council on the ground if you're in Geneva for the World Health Assembly. Um, Eliana mentioned a little bit about unofficial side events. There are so many different side events hosted by a variety of different organizations that you can attend. And we attempt to collect as many of those as possible on our events calendar, which I can go over in um, a few slides down from now. But um, they sort of run the gamut of different issue areas, depending on uh, what maybe is anticipated to be a big topic on the agenda. You might see a lot of events focus on that issue. But as Eliana mentioned, there are just, the agenda is so expansive that the events really run the gamut. So you're very likely to find something that interests you or is relevant to your work. Also, as we mentioned, we'll be hosting a GHC networking happy hour um, and we can share more information about that following this uh, meeting. So attending side meetings uh, with WHO colleagues or member state del delegates is another main reason why folks go to Geneva. It's an opportunity to meet with as many people as possible because everyone's in the same space for one week a year focusing on this major event. So it really is a great opportunity not only to go to events to network, 
but also to try and grab people on the sideline and say, hey, can we meet and talk about this? Um, it's a really great opportunity for networking. Sometimes even beyond tracking the official agenda, it is a main draw for folks going to Geneva for the World Health Assembly. And finally, monitoring the negotiations. Um, and if you're a member a member state or an NSA in official relations with WHO, being able to make statements on different agenda items. As Eliana mentioned, it's only possible to make these statements um, if you're a member of civil society, if you're an NSA in official relations with WHO. And in a further slide, we can talk about um, what GHC plans to make statements on and what focus areas GHC will um, be tracking most closely at the upcoming World Health Assembly. So if you're not in Geneva for WHA, that doesn't mean that you can't engage in a lot of different activities virtually. Um, if you're a GHC member, you can contribute to our individual and constituency statements. Um, you can amplify those statements and other key messages using our social media toolkit and track events mm -hmm. and attend virtual events using our um, events calendar, as well as tracking the official proceedings via the live stream. Um, we also share with our members updates pre and post WHA to share analysis about how the proceedings went um, and what decisions were made and what those impacts might be of those decisions. So next slide, please. So thank you. These are a few of our key issue areas that we'll be tracking most closely at the World Health Assembly. As Eliana mentioned, there are so many items being discussed at WHA. They're already planning evening sessions, which sounds like so much fun. <laughs> um, and member states and NSA delegations will be able to make statements on these agenda items. Uh, statements read right on the floor are part of the WHA official record. And on this slide, like I mentioned, you'll see the key issue, key issue areas GHC is tracking closely. We will plan to leave constituency statements, as Eliana mentioned, joining together with other NSAs and official relations with WHO, as well as a few individual statements. Regardless of whether your organization is an NSA and official relations with WHO, if you're a GHC member, you'll be able to provide input to GHC's official statements. So let's go through each of these agenda items listed here, and we'll provide a bit more information about what GHC's focus is and what are some expected decisions in each of these areas. Eliana, do you want to kick us off with UHC? Sure. So um, many of us have been tracking universal health coverage and various different events um, and key moments. So this year's World Health Assembly, as it usually does, has a whole agenda item around universal health coverage. This is actually an agenda item that we as non-state actors and official relations with WHO are allowed to give constituency or group statements. So Global Health Council will be leading a group statement um, in collaboration with various other organizations around UHC. And one of the key messages that we're looking to share in this group statement is really a focus on um, addressing health equity issues when while achieving universal health coverage, um, really acknowledging that there are huge inequities across the world when it comes to access and quality um, of healthcare and a lot of marginalized and vulnerable groups continuously get left behind. So our statement's really gonna look at what we wanna recommend that member states do to address those health equity issues. Um, so it's, we're gonna talk a lot about our focus on primary healthcare as a way to increase access of comprehensive health services to all people, um, strengthening the health and care workforce, which is really key and important, especially since we've seen this through the recent COVID pandemic. Um, why it's so important for governments to equitably invest in health resources and in healthcare, um, a, important focus on health data and making sure that member states are routinely collecting disaggregated data 
So we know who is being left behind and why in different countries, and then that can give us answers, answers as to how we can address that. Um, and then one of the things that is important that's happening at World Health Assembly is there's going to be a resolution um, proposed by Slovenia and Thailand on social participation. Um, and we as Global Health Council are, are incredibly supportive of this resolution since social participation um, really uh, asks governments to not only offer and create platforms for many different stakeholders, including civil society to participate in policy and decision-making for health, but also to like finance those platforms um, and to do them consistently. Uh, so governments are addressing the actual needs of people and people are allowed to speak out about what's missing in the health system and what governments should be addressing. Um, so in terms of UHC, I think that covers most of the issue areas that we're going to be focusing our statements on. And then we are tracking and very much supporting and promoting this social participation resolution. Um, I'll kick it back to you, Ansley. Thanks, Eliana. That was super helpful. Um, so our next agenda item is antimicrobial resistance. Um, member states are continuing to negotiate and finalize a resolution on AMR. Uh, but they're also set to note a report outlining WHO's strategic and operational priorities to address AMR between the years of 2025 and 2035. Uh, GHC plans to make an individual statement on AMR. It's not open to um, a longer constituency statement made with other NSAs, but we'll likely be recommending member states commit to developing new and improved antimicrobials and other health tools to help combat and fight AMR, as well as encourage WHO and member states to work together to increase public awareness about the threat of AMR um, and ensure access to infection prevention and control measures like um, quality water sanitation and hygiene. Um, we think the focus on AMR at WA, WHA this year is particularly important as well, given the UN high level meeting that is said to happen um, uh, focus on AMR later this year at the UN General Assembly. Another really, really big topic happening this year at WHA is the Intergovernmental Negotiating Body and its discussions and negotiations on a pandemic agreement. Um, so you may have heard that this uh, process is happening and kicked off a few years ago in 2021. Uh, with member states in the lead. Um, and it was is set to wrap up this year ahead of uh, World Health Assembly in 2024. Negotiations are still ongoing and many issues remain a bit contentious between different member states, including topics such as pathogen access and benefit sharing, as well as intellectual property rights and technology transfer and the ninth meeting of the IMB, which is the Intergovernmental Negotiating Body, is set to resume in just a few weeks later this month on April 28th. And we're actually expecting a new draft of the pandemic treaty later this week on Thursday, April 18th. Um, so negotiations continue, but are definitely not wrapped up just yet. Another focus area for GHC and a big topic of conversation at WHA will be climate change and health. Member states are negotiating a resolution on climate change and health as well. Um, and negotiations on this resolution uh, are close to being finalized, but aren't there quite yet due to a lack of consensus on language relating to gender. To gender. Uh, excuse me, and GHC will plan to lead a constituency statement focused on the intersections of climate change and health, as well as health system adaptation with input from GHC members, as well as other NSAs as well. Eliana, can I turn to you for GPW 14 and NSA engagement? Sure. <clears throat> so many of you probably have seen that right now, the World Health Organization is developing the global, the 14th global program of work. Um, this is the very first time that WHO um, opens up consultations 
with people outside of just member states. So there have been open consultations to feed into the global program of work um, over the past few months. Um, they've allowed different uh, civil society organizations um, and other partners and stakeholders to join webinars that they've opened up to gather feedback on what should go into the global program of work. Um, they've also shared drafts of the global program of work and asked organizations to submit feedback in writing. Um, I believe they've, they've done about three or four rounds of that, um, if I'm remembering correctly. Um, so this is really a kind of historic moment in the sense that they've really broadened um, engagement of other stakeholders in developing uh, the GPW. Um, there is an opportunity for GHC yeah. to lead on a constituency statement or a group statement for the Global Program of Work. And we are looking to lead a statement with various other non-state actors. Um, in official relations with WHO. And one of the key messages that we're going to be sharing in our statement is how important it is for this type of engagement with civil society and other stakeholders in developing the program of work, but also in implementing and monitoring the program of work. So we're really gonna be emphasizing and recommending that WHO and member states continue to do that. If many of you have seen the draft uh, GPW, it is very ambitious. It has quite a lot in there. So one of the messages that we're going to be sharing in our statement is to make sure that we're finding ways to actually finance the global program of work because without funding, um, there's really gonna be no way for WHO to implement all of the work that they've set out to do. Um, so that's going to be another um, message that we're going to be, be looking at. And then lastly, and this is very similar to one of our messages under the universal health coverage agenda item, but really urging governments to routinely collect data in their monitoring of uh, GPW-14 and ensuring that that data is looking at what's happening in those populations that are most vulnerable and marginalized to make sure that all of the activities in the GPW-14 are benefiting all people um, and not just a few people and having those populations mostly left behind stay behind. Um, so those are the key highlights from our current statement. Of course, we're gonna be working with our partners um, and our members to further draft our statement. So, um, it might change, but that's the, the gist of it. So back to you, Ensley. Thanks so much, Eliana. Can we go to the next slide, please? So this is a screen grab of our events calendar and we'll have a special events tag for WHA. So you'll be able to see any WHA specific event um, that we are collecting. This is something that we do annually every year to serve as a resource, not just to members, but to the whole global health community to try and um, collate as many WHA related events as we possibly can. You'll also see at the top of this screen grab and as well as um, at the very top with the link there, how to submit your WHA events to our events calendar. If you're on the events page, at globalhealth.org forward slash events, you can click that button that's green, submit events to the community calendar. And that is the best, easiest way for you to get your WHA event on our events calendar. Can we go to the next slide, please? Actually, Ansley, do you mind if I add something here quickly? Sure, absolutely. <clears throat> um, just to say, since I've seen a question in the chat about this specifically, um, this is also a way for you to not only see what events are happening at WHA, but also many people have asked, asked how to register to these events. And what you'll be able to do is click on the event title, and that usually will have information on how you can register, especially if it's an event that's open. There are some events that are going to be invitation only, um, but I'd have to say most of the events at World Health Assembly, the side events, um, the unofficial side events are are open to mostly everybody. So 
the way that you register is you'll either get an invitation um, over email. And if you also want to proactively go into our events calendar and click on some of those events and see how you can register, you can do it that way as well. Thanks, Eliana. That's a great point. And especially on virtual uh, uh, hybrid events, at least if there's in-person and virtual attendance, you're usually able to register beforehand as well and attend. Um, but thanks for that. So I think earlier in the presentation, we mentioned a uh, social media toolkit, but GHC shares a social media toolkit every year, sort of like we collect events every year. That includes key messages, um, specifically related to the key issue areas that we talked about a few slides ago that we're tracking most closely and planning to make statements on. And we really encourage members, partners, and everyone to share these messages uh, in the lead up to, during, and following WHA 77. We'll plan to share that toolkit with you all um, early next month, so within the next few weeks, um, but please be on the lookout for that. Um, a reminder that the hashtag for this event, or one of the main ones, is hashtag WHA 77. We've also listed all of our social media handles um, that you can see below for Facebook, X, LinkedIn, Instagram, and YouTube. So please feel free to follow us, but also tag us in your posts as well. And if you have any additional takeaways, please feel free to email events at globalhealth.org. Thanks so much. And next slide, please. So to wrap things up, we talked a lot about um, the events page. Um, you'll see here, it links to so many different helpful things, especially about the pandemic agreement. It has a, a really nice Q&A. It has links to all the documents that you might need for the World Health Assembly that get added on sort of as we get closer to the, to the event and resolutions and reports are finalized, they get added to the documents page. It's really, really helpful as you go in um, to the World Health Assembly, especially if you haven't been in person before, there is a really helpful thing called the Daily Journal. Um, as Eliana, Eliana mentioned earlier in the presentation, the agenda tends to change because of these longer evening sessions, things get switched around and the Daily Journal is a really helpful way to, when you wake up in the morning, see what the Secretariat is planning for that day because sometimes things get switched around. You might be expecting AMR to pop up on the agenda that day, but it actually isn't. So it can help you decide if you're gonna be at the Palais or if you're gonna attend side events and, and uh, host side meetings and other things like that. So I would really encourage you to check out that um, events page and the documents page that, that is linked from there. As we mentioned before, we've got our events calendar that we will continuously update. Um, starting now, we've already received mm -hmm. submissions from members and partners about different events that they're hosting. So we hope that you can use that as a reference to help plan your week, whether you're in person or following proceedings virtually. Uh, as I mentioned a few minutes ago, we'll be sharing the link to our social media toolkit very soon within the next few weeks. And on our website, you can find more information about what we've done at WHA, and you'll find a, um, a link to this recording and statements that we make and things of that nature at globalhealth.org forward slash world dash health dash assembly. Before we move to question and answers, and we really appreciate the questions that we've already received in the chat. I know Eliana and I are trying to respond to as many as possible. Uh, we wanted to pause and share a quick Zoom poll with you all just to see where you all are at. Have you attended WHA before? What are you looking forward to? Things like that. So Rebecca or Eliana, how can we access this poll? So it should go up on the screen now. Um, it looks like people are already answering the questions. So <clears throat> it looks like Rebecca just launched the poll. Um, there are four questions to the poll. So keep in mind that you have to scroll down to see the other questions. Um, but please, uh, as it pops up on your screen, take the time to answer these. Um, I'll just kind of go through the questions now as people answer, but the first is, have you been to the World Health Assembly? We wanted to get a sense for how many people online 
have attended. Um, I know for some people, this might be the very first time you attend World Health Assembly, um, which is really exciting. And you'll see how crazy it is once you land in Geneva. Um, are you planning to attend World Health Assembly 77, so WHA 77? So um, I'm seeing that quite a few people, about 55% so far, will be attending, which is great. Many undecided. I know it is very expensive uh, to uh, fly to Geneva, especially around this time during World Health Assembly, because all of the prices for hotels and flights skyrocket. Um, you can imagine how many people land in Geneva around this time. Um, for many people, as I said, uh, they join uh, in person, even if they don't have access to the Palais, just because there's some so much going on outside of the Palais and also keeping in mind that it is still an opportunity for you to uh, meet with member states and other stakeholders um, because they're all in Geneva. So definitely gives you an opportunity outside of official proceedings to have those meetings. So the next question is, uh, what agenda item are you most interested in? And then the next is, how else are you planning to engage for WHA 77 through GHC? So I can't actually see the long answers to those, but um, we'll take a look. I know that we can um, so we can create a, a report for this poll and we'll be really interested in hearing from you all on what you're tracking um, and following, um, hoping that uh, what we'll be tracking at GHC will be, will be helpful to you. And as Ansley said, for our members, we do provide summaries. Um, we'll provide an, an email with uh, some information about what we're tracking and things like that before we head out to Geneva, we'll also have a summary email about what happened um, at the end of WHA. So thanks for those who submitted their answers to the polls. That was really helpful to learn a little bit about uh, you and your interests and your experience at WHA. Um, I do just quickly want to um, talk about ECOSOC status because I've seen a lot of questions about whether people with ECOSOC status are able to attend the World Health Assembly. And Ansley, correct me if I'm wrong, but it is completely different process. So even if you have a ground, an ECOSOC grounds pass, that definitely does not mean that you can um, attend World Health Assembly. Unfortunately, it's a different process that you have to go through. And Ansley, I don't know if you wanna expand on that. <clears throat> no, that's right. Unfortunately, it is a different process. It's separate with the UN and WHO, UN being in New York and WHA, or WHO being in Geneva. You're totally right about that. Unfortunately, if we wish the process were a little simpler, for sure. Yeah. Um, let's see, there were also questions about how to contribute to statements. Um, so in terms of Global Health Council statements, Oh, thank you. I can see now uh, some of the results from our poll. So I can go through those in a little bit. Um, so in terms of Global Health Council statements, so you would have to be a GHC member, first of all, to be able to contribute to our statements. Um, so usually what we do is we will, for those people who are interested in contributing to statements, we'll, we'll get an idea of who those organizations are that are GHC members. Um, and then we will reach out to you all with drafts and, and get some um, inputs from you on those. And then of course we, for the group statements or the constituency statements, we will reach out to um, other non-state actors to contribute to those. With the group statements, I should say that um, you can only sign on as an official supporter of the group statements if you're a non-state actor at official relations with WHO. So even if you're a GHC member um, and you contribute to the group statement, we unfortunately can't put your organization's name on the statement if you're not an NSA in official relations. Um, but of course, I think what's important is the content and, and getting that content out, especially for member states to hear. So. For GHC members, you will have an opportunity to contribute to both, whether you're an NSA or not. Um, anything you want to add, Ansley, about that? No, I think you covered it. Um, 
even though I think we mentioned this in the presentation too, if you're not able to sign on as an official signatory of a statement, if you're a GHC member and we're making the statement, your input is still very much valued and welcome, and there'll be a process for how you can contribute to uh, the Global Health Council statements in that way. <clears throat> I also saw questions about becoming non-state actors in official relations with WHO, so I can cover a little bit about that. Um, so there's an application process that you have to complete to become an NSA in official relations with WHO. It's a very extensive application process that requires quite a bit of paperwork. And the way the process works is the WHO secretariat reviews all of the applications that they receive. Um, and then based on criteria that is actually set that has been negotiated by member states, they ensure that your organization meets all the criteria um, to become an NSA. Then what the secretariat does is it prepares a document and recommends to um, member states uh, which organizations should be granted NSA status. And then it's really up to member states, specifically the program budget um, an administration uh, committee, um, which then gets passed to the executive board, but they basically either accept the recommendation um, for those organizations or they don't. Um, for many of you who have seen, there has been a, a bit of controversy around um, becoming NSAs recently. Um, there is what, what's called FENSA, the framework for engaging uh, non-state actors. Uh, this is a framework that was negotiated by member states and it's essentially supposed to be a way to allow non-state actors to engage and participate in everything that's happening at uh, WHO. Um, people have felt that it hasn't necessarily been a applied in the best way and in many cases has impeded people's ability because the application process is so long and because it's just very difficult and time consuming to get NSA status. Um, you know, some people have found it to not be very helpful. Um, most recently, the WHO Secretariat recommended a set of organizations that had met all the criteria that's in FENSA and they had recommended them to be granted NSA status and member states recently in the executive board have failed to grant them NSA status um, for reasons we don't quite understand, but we feel that it's more along the lines of their, they don't really love what the organizations do, um, which unfortunately is not what FENSA is about. You know, It's not about having member states kind of pick and choose which organizations are granted NSA status or not. Um, so I'm sure you saw that there was a letter that, a, a sign on letter that Global Health Council sent out um, to get support for upholding FENSA because FENSA is obviously very important for us. Um, as non-state actors, um, it's really the only way that we can participate in these official proceedings and have member states listen to some of these key messages that we want to send to them. And so it's very important for us that member states uphold FENSA um, and you know, really uh, support the WHO's recommendations and due diligence that they do um, complete before they make their recommendations on who can become NSAs. So as you all can see, becoming an NSA is a whole process um, and it's it's not uh, very simple and there's a lot of, I think, politics are going around um, right now in particular with this situation um, where so far member states have not uh, completely accepted the recommendation of of WHO's uh, recent applicants. Um, so that's a little bit about NSAs and FENSA. Again, Ansley, if I missed anything or if you wanted to add anything, please feel free. Not on FENSA, but we are getting some questions about NSAs um, and how to attend official proceedings. So just to recap, Every organization that is a non-state actor in official relations with WHO this year and in the few years in the past have gotten six badges to enter the Palais. And I've seen some other comments in the chat about sort of limited NSA engagement. 
um, for example, not being able to make virtual statements and that sort of limiting the participation of NSAs and in a, and yes, we understand that this is, it's not an ideal situation. We don't think it is either. Um, but unfortunately at this point, we have six badges as GHC mm -hmm. and other NSAs and official relations are in the same boat that we are. Um, as Eliana mentioned, we have five badges spoken for for the Global Health Council, with uh, one badge being up for lottery for GHC members, and we'll be able to share more information about that in the coming days and weeks. Um, so if you're a GHC member, you'll, you will receive more information, not just about the badges, but about how to be into statements and things like that. Anything you want to add there, Eliana, about NSA badges or NSA engagement in general? Yeah, um, <clears throat> so Beaster provided a lot of great information um, as well, so please take a look at the chat. But unless you have a badge, you cannot enter in to like the room where the official proceedings are happening. Um, typically, non-state actors that have badges are allowed to be in the room where the proceedings are happening all the time because of the construction, the there's not a, enough space for member states and NSAs to be in the room. So usually what happens is there are overflow rooms um, where people with badges sit and they're able to follow what's happening um, in the overflow room. Um, and then when we give our statements, we are escorted into the room where the member states are um, and where the official proceedings are happening. Um, and we actually do give our statements in the room. Um, it's not the best scenario, obviously. Um, it makes a huge difference to be in the room when people are having discussions versus being in an overflow room, um, really to, to get the sense for like the feeling in the room and to have um, that kind of proximity with member states um, as they're negotiating different resolutions and things like that. Um, but unfortunately, that's kind of how we've uh, been invited to participate so far as NSAs. We are hoping that once the construction is over, we will again be allowed to enter into the room with the official where the official proceedings are happening. But as of now, we only do it to give our statements. And when we're done giving our statement, we're escorted right back out. So we're, we're really not in the room for very long. Um, I'm trying to see if there are any other questions. So yes, Lindsay, in terms, so GHC will lottery the last um, badge that we have and that lottery will go to only GHC members. Um, Ansley, correct me if I'm wrong, but we will be sending an email to our members asking who is interested in joining uh, inputting into our statements. If you are interested, and I see a lot of interest um, in that, please respond to that email and then we will send you all drafts of the statement. Uh, usually the drafts are based on, you know, what's happening in terms of current events, especially with the INB, we're hearing a lot about what's happening um, in the sessions and with the global program of work, there have been a lot of consultations and drafts. And even now we're still waiting on the last draft of uh, the GPW 14 before we finalize our statements. So there's a lot happening right now that provide inputs into what we say in these statements. Um, but typically what we do is we base those statements off of that. And then also very much off of, you know, what we've said in the past, whether it be um, in the last, WHA 76, or even we're always at the executive board meetings, which again happen in January. They happen before WHA, and we often give statements there as well, um, even group and constituency statements. And so we'll base a lot of what you will see this time around off of what um, you might have heard or seen in the executive board or at WHA 76. That's a great point, Eliana. I would just say that sort of like you alluded to, some of these reports and resolutions and things don't get finalized until right before the World Health Assembly. So there's time to tweak our statements, not only for input from, from members or NSA partners, but also 
like Eliana was mentioning, from these reports and from these resolutions to make sure that they're as you know accurate, up to date as possible, and that we're recommending things in the strongest possible terms with the best information available at the time. Yep. Um, what I will say, and Bistra, thank you. I agree with Bistra. I mean, attending the live streams is, I mean, it's very similar to being in an overflow room and kind of watching it on the screen. Like, even if you don't have um, access into the palais, into an overflow room, I mean, live streaming is a really good way to track what happens. The only thing I would say about that is, as Ansley mentioned, make sure that every morning you take a look at the journal so that you know what people are going to be discussing that day, because after Monday, that agenda that you see is going to change completely. So whatever order you see those agenda items listed right now, um, that will definitely change after Monday. And so if you're waking up really early in the United States to track proceedings on the live stream, um, you definitely want to know if if they've shifted whichever um, topic you're you're interested in listening to. I should also say that they're recorded too. So if you don't want to listen live, you can always go back to the live stream and listen to the recorded sessions and like fast forward and rewind through conversations um, and back and forth that happens. So in terms of what is the link for the changing agenda? So as Ansley, Ansley said, um, we provided in the PowerPoint, and, and again, we're gonna be sharing the PowerPoint in this recording with everyone, but um, our last slide has links to the WHA 77 page, webpage, and that webpage has the links to the live stream, the links to the preliminary agenda that's up now, there will be a, a link to the final agenda, and then also all of the, um, the documents and resolutions that they're going to be discussing are also included there. Thank you, Ansley. She actually just put it in the chat, which is really helpful. Yeah, there uh, I'm hearing from Michelle in the chat that it's 100% overflow this year. That's yes, it's that's correct, Michelle. There will definitely be an overflow room and we it's been confirmed that NSAs will only have access to the actual room to give their, their statements. Okay, any other questions since we have about five minutes left? Otherwise we can go ahead and close. These are all really great questions. So thank you so much for, for those and for attending. I think Ansley, it's okay for us to close and um, I'll just say thank you, Ansley, for helping with the presentation today. And of course, we have a lot of GHC members behind the scenes that have helped make this happen. So I wanted to thank them as well. Um, we wish everyone a great World Health Assembly this year, whether you're attending in person or whether you're going to be trekking online. And you'll be receiving more information uh, from us shortly after this webinar with the recording and the presentation and um, other information. Again, feel free to to email either events or our advocacy email if you have any questions moving forward. Thank you, everybody. Thank you for joining. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.